Hello everybody, it's good to be with you again tonight to study from the book of Acts. I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday at either 9 or 11, and I hope all of you can be present for class at 10. We are wrapping up our study of the book of Hebrews this week, I believe, and for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. It's based on your address in the church directory. Uh, those addresses are already there, kind of pre-approved on the list, but guests are always welcome. So if you can join us this coming Sunday, we would love it. We would love to see you, whether you can sign up or not. But uh, members, we really do uh, still appreciate that. Tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts, which is a history of the early church written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Luke is giving this man just a summary of the history of the early church from the beginning of the church and then for roughly the next 30 years, the ministry of Peter and then also the ministry of Paul. Paul would be kind of the last two-thirds of the book. So that's where we are tonight. Up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first 12 chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we have the ascension, the beginning of the church, the carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, Stephen. Uh, the eunuch's response to Philip's question, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch replies, well, how can I unless someone guides me? In Acts 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, the Lord identifies himself to Saul by saying, I am Jesus. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa as Cornelius sends messengers looking for Peter. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles, as Peter explains uh, the baptism of Cornelius to the Jews back in Jerusalem. And then last week in Acts 12, we had Peter liberated again. After the execution of the Apostle James, uh, Peter's also arrested by King Herod to please the Jews. But the church prayed about that constantly. Peter was released from prison by an angel. And by the end of that chapter, King Herod is eaten by worms and he dies this excruciating death over a period of several days, according to the historian Josephus. Well, tonight we move into Acts chapter 13, and our summary tonight is missionaries sent out. Missionaries sent out. If you have a copy of the Bible, a hard copy, uh, I would uh, strongly recommend writing these before the chapter heading. So right before chapter 1, right there, Ascension, then beginning of church on chapter 2 and so on throughout the book. It is just a valuable study tool. Uh, class tonight might be a little bit shorter. I'm expecting it to be anyway because of how this chapter is divided. We could press forward and cover the whole chapter, but I'm usually aiming for around 45 minutes, give or take. And if we go anywhere beyond where I think we'll get tonight, that would perhaps put us over an hour. So I don't want to do that. I value your time. And I know we could study the Bible for the next six hours. We could justify that, but I know we have schedules. We got to get to bed. There's work and stuff going on. So anyway, I just want to keep it uh, concise here. So our first paragraph tonight is Acts 13 verses 1, 2, and 3. So if you're not there already, I would appreciate it if you could join me in Acts 13 verses 1, 2, and 3. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manane, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. We have a few very significant things going on here, starting with the fact that what is known as Paul's first missionary journey starts not in Jerusalem, but it starts from Antioch, and that's not maybe what we would expect if we could predict this going forward, but it starts in Antioch. It seems that the church in Antioch is perhaps larger at this point in time. It is perhaps better equipped uh, financially and manpower-wise, better equipped to send out missionaries at this point. Uh, remember, the church in Jerusalem had been the subject of some intense persecution, and people ran everywhere, kind of just the apostles were left back there for a while. And this persecution came first from the Sanhedrin, then from Saul, and then it's been coming lately from King Herod. Antioch, though, is farther north, has perhaps been spared the worst of this. Also, it is significant that the church in Antioch is made up of quite a few Gentiles. And so we have Gentiles reaching out to Gentiles. We have Gentiles, or Greeks, sending missionaries to the rest of the Greek-speaking world. Remember, a vast majority of people in the world are not Jews. Most are Gentiles. So we have Gentiles sending missionaries into the rest of the world, which would probably be better received 
um, than Jewish people in Jerusalem sending out missionaries. So it seems very wise there. Obviously, God is the one who is orchestrating this. In verse 1, we have a list of prophets and teachers. Teachers are obviously those who teach the word of God. Uh, prophets, literally, according to the definition of the word, are those who speak forth, prophet. So to speak before, to speak forth on God's behalf. Uh, sometimes this involves predicting the future. A lot of times people hear about a prophet and they immediately think, ooh, a fortune teller, somebody who knows the future. Well, that can be part of it. Um, but other times, these are people, I would say, in my own mind, the way I look at it, these are people who have a hotline to God. God is there, and God is communicating directly. God tells them what to say, and they say it. Uh, they speak forth. That is the meaning of the word. Again, sometimes it's telling the future. Sometimes it's just speaking the word of God. We know Barnabas. He's here. We've had him uh, referred to a few times in the book already. Uh, Simeon is perhaps new to us. Not the name Simeon, but this Simeon. We don't know much about this Sim Simeon other than he was called Niger. Uh, this was his nickname, and it is a word meaning dark. And so we assume he was perhaps dark-skinned, or at least more so than most in this area at this time. Uh, we're introduced to Lucius, and uh, all we know about him is that he is from Cyrene. Remember, we learned in Acts 11.20, uh, just a few weeks ago, that certain men from Cyprus and Cyrene came to Antioch for the purpose of teaching the Greeks about Jesus. And maybe Lucius is one of these men. We don't know. Uh, but it does seem to, to make sense. Uh, the other person we know from uh, Cyrene is Simon. And that was the man who was pressed into service by the Romans to carry Jesus' cross. And so it's a, it's a possibility that Simon of Cyrene went back uh, home after that experience and told people about it, and, and people were converted in that way, maybe. Uh, the other man here is Manain. All we know about him is that he had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, perhaps Manain was some kind of servant, uh, some kind of official in King Herod's administration. Maybe he had some kind of government job, so we got a bureaucrat here. And then we also have Saul, but uh, these seem to be the, the leading men of the congregation. These are some of the names that uh, maybe Theophilus would have known. Uh, that could be a possibility here. These may not be people listed because we might know them, obviously. Uh, but Luke is writing Theophilus, and uh, let me throw some names at you that you might recognize. In verse 2, we find that these men were serving the Lord and fasting. We aren't told exactly what they were doing. We aren't told exactly how they were fasting. Very sparse details here. But during this time of service and fasting, the Holy Spirit steps into this situation and tells them to set apart Barnabas and Saul for some special mission. Uh, one of the commentaries I was reading earlier today made the point of saying that the first missionary journey happened not because of some kind of a board meeting. It, it wasn't some kind of a church conference that got together, but rather the Holy Spirit orchestrated this. And so at this point, seeing what's going on, they pray and they fast some more. Uh, as far as I can tell, the law of Moses never commanded fasting. That was shocking to me when I learned that a number of years back. The old law never commanded fasting. Uh, they were told to humble their souls on the Day of Atonement. Generally, this was interpreted at fasting. But as far as I can tell, there's nowhere in the Old Testament where God said, Thou shalt go without food for 24 hours. That There's, no, there's nothing like that in the Old Testament. But fasting is never demanded. A later God would have some things to say about fasting in the prophets, but it's primarily because these people were fasting, thinking they were being pleasing to God, as they were simultaneously mistreating the poor and lying and divorcing their wives and, and on and on and on. So God did have something to say about that. And that basically, I'm just paraphrasing a few scattered verses. Your fasting is an abomination to me. You think you're doing this to make me happy, but you're not. Um, but nevertheless, there must have been some benefit to it. Moses fasted, David fasted, Daniel fasted, Jesus fasted. And now we have an example of fasting in the early church. Uh, here, the purpose seems to be perhaps to focus their minds on what God is calling them to do. We also have a reference here to the laying on of hands, another practice that we're not too familiar with today. As we've discussed before, it's easy for us to think that the laying on of hands has to do with something miraculous. And often it is uh, something miraculous. Healings sometimes happen that way. Uh, sometimes it's a reference, though, to somebody being beat up. 
to lay hands on a person. I think uh, I've heard the police refer to going hands-on with somebody. Have you heard that phrase? And uh, literally, they are laying their hands on people. Well, that's not what's going on here. They, the church isn't beating up the, these men. Uh, we do know the miraculous gifts were given to people through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Uh, not everybody could do that, just the apostles. We read about that in Acts chapter 8. And uh, this is one of several ways we know that we do not have the miraculous spiritual gifts today. We don't have any apostles to give them to us. And here the laying on of hands seems to simply refer to some way of setting people apart for a special purpose or mission. Kind of a public acknowledgement that these people are being sent out by the church. And we see this with the appointment of the seven men over in Acts chapter 6. So I don't know exactly what that would have looked like. I would think the, the leaders of the church putting their hands on the shoulders of these people saying, saying this person is now representing us and they're sending them out on this mission. So the church sends them away. Uh, as we discussed a few weeks ago, this doesn't mean they just send them out the door. It doesn't mean they just wave goodbye. That's not what it means by sending them. But it probably also means that they supplied them, that they equipped them for the mission. They sent them with food and supplies and finances or whatever they needed so they could do the work that they needed to do. So let's continue tonight with Acts 13, verses 4 through 12. Acts 13, verses 4 through 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. To try to help us picture where this team is going, I think we might have found uh, some decent maps that we can share online, at least for now. I'm still looking. Um, these use the same Creative Commons license that we use in our Bible Correspondence courses. Basically, feel free to use this, but don't put a more restrictive license on it. So we can't copyright it out from under these people. We can use it, but we can't copyright it ourselves, if I've understood this correctly, by reading the fine print. Uh, they also ask that we give them the credit, which we gladly do. We've done this a number of times through the years. We want to give credit to artists when we can. Uh, BibleTalk.tv is uh, the source here. They're sponsored by a number of churches of Christ, many of them in Oklahoma. And so we're very thankful for their graphics tonight and probably going forward. I've zoomed in a bit on this one to show us how the group leaves from Seleucia along the coast near Antioch. So they go from Antioch down to Seleucia. Then they go, they travel over to Salamis, a city on the island of Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is that island in the Mediterranean Sea that looks a bit like the United States. Remember I pointed that out a few weeks ago. I don't know if anybody else thinks of it that way, but to me, <laughs> it's like a tiny United States. I think it's about 100 miles across. Uh, so in my mind, Salamis is about where New York City should be. Uh, in Salamis, they start preaching, teaching in the synagogues of the Jews. This will be a pattern on these trips. So they're establishing that early on. They'll, they'll often start with the Jews in the synagogues, then they'll get kicked out, and then they'll move along to the Gentiles. Um, by the way, have we ever wondered why they go to Cyprus first? We have no indication that the Spirit said, go here. You might have, but we're not told. So why Cyprus? Out of, out of all the places in the world, why go there? Why go to Cyprus? We aren't told. But do we think it might have something to do with Barnabas being from Cyprus? I think there's another passage that tells us that Barnabas was from Cyprus. 
And I would not be surprised to find out someday that they go to Cyprus so that Barnabas can start this trip by sharing the gospel with his own family. That Barnabas goes where he knows the land. Let's start out somewhere familiar. Let's go stay with my people. We'll go there, we'll preach there first, and then move on from there. Hopefully someday we'll meet Barnabas and we can say, hey, why did you guys go to Cyprus first? Why not go some other direction? And I would not be shocked at all to learn uh, that that is the reason why. Uh, nevertheless, they then make their way across the island over to Paphos. Again, about a hundred mile journey across the island there. Uh, I'm thinking Paphos is uh, kind of, I don't know, somewhere about where San Francisco should be or some city out there on the west coast. Uh, but Paphos is on the western end of Cyprus. As we go back to the text, we find at the end of verse 5, that they also have John as their helper. This is a reference to John Mark. He and Barnabas are cousins. So on this first trip, at least at the beginning, we have Barnabas and Saul and John Mark. It's a rather small group. Um, remember, Jesus did tell his followers to go out at least two by two. You don't go out alone preaching the gospel. You try to take somebody with you. There's a lot of wisdom in that. So we've got Barnabas and Saul and John Mark. And here John is described as being a helper. It's almost like he's not, you know, there's Barnabas, there's Saul, and then kind of the little footnote down here at the bottom, there is John Mark. He is the assistant. He is the helper. He is assisting on this mission. And uh, John Mark comes along really not as a driving force, but he's more observing and kind of running around doing the things that need to get done. In verse 6, we have the first real opposition. And Paphos, they run into Sergius Paulus. He's an intelligent man. He's serving as the proconsul. So he's a government official. And again, this would be, I think, pretty appealing for Theophilus to hear if he, in fact, is a government official, as we've assumed. Uh, this man uh, asked for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Well, why does that sound familiar? Isn't that pretty much what happened with Cornelius? Also, a government official, a Roman centurion, is asking to hear the gospel. And so something similar is happening, happening here. So this, this government leader, this proconsul, is asking to hear the word of God from uh, Barnabas and Saul. However, they get some opposition from a Jewish false prophet, a guy named Bar-Jesus, the son of somebody named Jesus. Jesus or Joshua uh, is the same name, would have been a common name back then. So son of Joseph or son of Jesus or a Joshua, rather. Uh, he was also known as Elimus the Magician. And this man's mission was to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And so this is his mission, to step in and keep this from happening. If he's serving the proconsul, there's a chance this guy can kind of see where this is going, and he's about to be unemployed. Uh, in response, Saul, not Barnabas, but Saul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, looks at the man and speaks directly to him. So he's talking to the bad guy here, the false prophet, fixes his gaze on him. So Saul is intently focused on this man. And Saul doesn't hold back, does he? This is a brutal verbal takedown. Saul is confident. He is speaking for God here. Saul is speaking on God's behalf. This is God speaking through the apostle. He accuses the man of being full of all deceit and fraud. He calls him a son of the devil, the enemy of all righteousness. And he accuses him of constantly making crooked the straight ways of the Lord. Remember how John the Baptist was to make straight the crooked ways? This guy is doing the opposite of that. He's making crooked the straight ways. He's making everything that's truly simple complicated. And there are sometimes people in the church who have a way of doing that, of taking what should be a rather simple teaching, and they complicate it with six pages of fine print arguing, and by the time you're done with it, you don't even know what they believe, uh, let alone what you should believe, and you just kind of give up trying to understand it. And so here is a man who is constantly making crooked the straight ways of the Lord. Uh, by the way, much of this could probably have been said about Saul himself a few years earlier, right? He was the one who was opposing the Lord, but now he's on the other end of it. In verse 11, Saul basically curses the man. That's the way I would kind of summarize this here. He makes it clear this is not coming from Saul. This isn't me. This is the Lord. The Lord's hand is upon you. 
It's kind of weird to think about that. Here's Saul looking, and it's almost as if he can see the hand of the Lord resting on this man about to do something terrible. And he does. He strikes him blind for a time. A mist and a darkness settles on this man. He basically has to wander around looking for somebody to lead him by the hand. Does that sound at all familiar? Isn't this what happened to Saul himself when he was struck blind on the road to Damascus? Certainly some very striking similarities here. Saul is kind of like, I kind of know how you feel, man. Uh, but this is, what, this is what's going to happen, and this is what does happen. At this point in verse 12, Luke tells us that the proconsul believes when he sees what has happened. So he's amazed at the, the teaching of the Lord. Uh, this is an interesting passage, but I hope we notice uh, this is a huge turning point in Saul's life. Do we see what Luke points out here for the first time up in verse 9? Saul was also known as Paul. So as far as I can tell, this is the first time now that we read about Paul being Paul. It's also the first time we see Paul taking a real leadership role. He's not following here, is he? He's leading this situation. And we notice something else. Up until this point, we read about Barnabas and Saul. They sent out Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul show up on the island and so on, as if Barnabas is the leader. But after this point, we usually read about references to Paul and Barnabas perhaps indicating that Paul now takes more of a leading role, even between the two of them on this mission team. In fact, I think, if I remember correctly, there's only one other time that the name Barnabas comes first. Every time after this, with that one exception, it is now Paul and Barnabas instead of Barnabas and Saul, as it has been. So this is a turning point in Paul's life. Kind of the question in my mind is, why is Paul called Paul? First of all, why is he called Paul instead of Saul? And then secondly, why the name Paul? Why choose that name? Uh, we're not told in scripture, but it's interesting to me that Saul is a Hebrew name and Paul is more of a Greek name. So either Paul had both names all along from birth. He was born a Roman, so there's some Greek stuff going on there. Either he had both names all along and he's now just shifting from one to the other because he's starting to reach out to the Gentiles. That's one possibility. He's just shifting the name that he already had, kind of like me using my middle name for some reason. Or two, Paul took his this name here on Cyprus for a reason. And I would kind of ask here, what might that reason be? Why Paul? Did we notice how one of Paul's first real success stories on this mission it was the conversion of Sergius Paulus. I'm thinking it's possible that Paul took on the name of this man who believed. I wouldn't swear to that or anything, but I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility. But this is very clearly a turning point in Saul's life. And personally, I am so thankful that we are finally at this point because it has been a real challenge for me over the past several weeks to refer to Saul as Saul. And I know I probably slipped a few times but every time I see the name Saul, I think to myself, must say Saul, must say Saul, don't say Paul because he's not Paul yet. Uh, but now I can finally refer to Paul as being Paul because Paul, that's the name that we know him by. Uh, in the next paragraph, Paul and Barnabas sail north to Perga and then they head inland to Antioch of Pisidia. So we got two Antiochs. This is Antioch number two coming in here where we have this sermon by Paul. And as I said earlier, I, I hate to dive in and, uh, you know, take the time to study his sermon because it's kind of a larger chunk. If we were to do that, we would be here for another half an hour. So I think this is a good place to take a break. So next week then, let's pick up, uh, if the Lord wills, with Acts 13.13 13, and then move on from there. And we'll come to the next phase in Paul's missionary journey, his first one. Uh, tonight, though, we've seen missionaries sent out. Missionaries sent out. If you want to write that in your Bible, that'd be great. Uh, if you can improve on this, let me know if you have something better than missionaries sent out. But to me, I don't see how to improve that one. But if you want to surprise the class, feel free to pass it on, and I'd uh, love to share it. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to study with us tonight. I hope you can be present for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And please also plan on joining us between those two services for a Bible study at, uh, at 10. Uh, let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who loves all people, Jews and Gentiles. And tonight we've seen your love preached in far off places for the very first time. We're thankful for Paul and Barnabas. We're thankful for John Mark. 
Like Sergius Paulus, we pray that our hearts would be open to the truth of your message, that we'd be eager to hear it as he was. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. And thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus we pray. Amen.